start by saying, I'm going to be what we call a devil's advocate. I do not necessarily believe what I'm going to say, but I want to say some things which will probably upset you. And what's in an end? That which we call a rose, by any other name, would smell as sweet. Some of you will have heard of that, others will not. But they were words that were written by someone called William Shakespeare, the bard of Avon, the English national poet. Romeo and Juliet, ladies, Juliet, act two, scene two, Juliet speaking. Now let's get rid of the word name and let's insert the word word. What's in a word that which we call a rose by any other word was smelled as sweet? And by what right, by what right do I stand before you now and we debate the meaning, the use of this word preservation? I mean, I guess I ought to blame this chap. This chap is my great great grandfather. If you ever read the Daily Mail, the English newspaper, it began with him. I write a lot, that's my Amazon page. I take off my clothes for the National Dailies. If you ask for my business card in England, you may not get a card that says orthopedic surgeon. You may get a card that says something like that. And if you go to that web, you will find a blog. I will also be the editor of this. I've been the editor of this. I found it and was the editor of this, and now I edit this. So to me, words are my living. That's what I think about. I think about words, I dream about words, I talk about words at breakfast. There are two words that I don't really understand in hip preservation surgery. The first is the word reconstruction, and the second is the word preservation. Let's have a look at reconstruction first of all. I mean, when as hip arthroscopic surgeons we talk about reconstruction, we are generally talking about a labral graft. That is what is called a hip reconstruction. And yet on Wednesday, I go off as a Red Cross surgeon, I go to Gaza, and there, that is what we call reconstruction. And after that, I go back to London, and that is what we call a reconstruction. So here is a simple word meaning so many different things. And so when we come to preservation, what do we mean? Well, I think probably by definition, I think hip arthroscopic surgeons think they are hip preservation surgeons. And John O'Hara will correct me, but I think hip <laughs> osteotomists think they are hip preservation surgeons. And it was because of this dilemma, because of my inability to understand and I wrote an editorial not very long ago, the subject was what I'm talking about now. What is hip preservation? You see, if we take that word, and I'm taking you in Greece, I mean, you have a very rich history. If we consider our language, the English language, 60% of the current English language comes from either yourselves, Greek, or Latin. 90% of scientific and medical English language comes from either Greek or Latin. I mean, for heaven's sake, there must be an input in Greek, or from Greek, to the word preservation. <laughs> now, I know it's ancient Greek, but would the Greeks amongst you read that word? And when you raise your hand, it's in ancient Greek, if you understand what it means. That, you see, contains 172 letters, and is the longest word in the world in history, and you own it. Okay, this is actually uh, in, in a translation, it's the name of the dish compounded of all kinds of dainties, fish and flesh and fowl and sauces. So, are you telling me, as Greeks, you do not have a part to play in the origin of the word preservation? I'm afraid you do not hang your words into your heads in shame. It is actually from the Latin. In the 4th and 10th centuries, preservare means to keep. Then we go to medieval Latin, which went to preservatio. Then we went to Old French, 
and they say, I'll pay. And then we end up in late Middle English preserving. Now, between the French and the English is the loss of the gender. You have le and la, you have e and o, I think in Greek. You have a gender. There are male and female nouns. We don't have those in English. And that was lost around the 15th and 16th centuries. And from there, we end up with the word preserve. So what is the definition of this word, preserve? Well, I've gone to the Cambridge English Dictionary because I'm not a real enthusiast about Oxford because I come from the other place. And we have the act of keeping something the same or preventing it from being damaged. So that is what you have to be if you are a hip preservation surgeon. So if you are keeping the hip the same, which you are not, then you are a hip preservation surgeon. If you're preventing it from being damaged, which you may be, then you might become a hip preservation surgeon. And if we look at hip arthroscopic surgery, if we look at all the things you can do at hip arthroscopy, for example, this list I put together to create some form of syllabus of teaching, and I'm simply going to put circles around some procedures which can be done through the hip arthroscope. Now, I'm not saying it's the right or the wrong thing to do. I'm simply saying this is what some people do do. And I don't believe any of those in the circles have anything to do with hip preservation. And yet, when we look at the literature surrounding hip preservation, look how it is increasing almost exponentially month on month. And what are we actually preserving? Are we preserving the shape and the morphology? Are we preserving the function? Are we doing nothing at all like that? I mean, could it just be we are actually protecting rather than preserving? Is that word preservation correctly applied to what we do anyway? And then what's the evidence that we're succeeding? I mean, can we actually say we are preventing hip replacement? Can we actually say our patients are better in the long term. Yes, of course we have lots of papers saying how patients feel better, but there are very, very few papers uh, which compare normal with what we do, and whether we actually prevent long-term damage is difficult to say, because most of it is uncontrolled. We simply do the best we can do. I mean, anyway, who are these people that call themselves hip preservation surgeons? I mean, I think by definition, if you do this, you are not a hip preservation surgeon. And yet, when you look at this, it's a wonderful operation, but it doesn't always succeed. It sometimes falls apart. And if you look at the registries, although with John O'Hara's discussion with me at breakfast this morning, I think Australia may now be saying something different. But if you have a look at that, if you happen to be about 70 or 80, yes, you have a hip replacement that is going to last a long time. If you're younger, if you're in the range we are here to discuss, then a hip replacement is generally going to fall apart quite early. I mean, look at the various operations which have been designed, keeping this in mind, the excision arthroplasty, Gaithorn and Girdleston in 1923 from the other place, Oxford, the hanging hip, the arthrodesis, intraarticular or extraarticular, the osteotomy, be it femoral or pelvic, and then the arthroplasty surgeons. I mean, they didn't really want to do a total hip, and so there was the ivory hip. Do you remember the ivory hip, which was so biologically compatible it would slowly shrivel up and disappear inside the human body? You've got the Wiles hip, um, a limited resection where all the records were lost thanks to a World War II bombing in London. You've got the Smith-Peterson interposition arthroplasty. You've got the resurfacing arthroplasty, which John O'Hara knows far more about it than anybody else in this room. You've got partial hip resurfacing. You've got the stubby stones, like them or hate them. But what are all of these surgeons doing? They are trying to avoid this. And what are we doing? We are trying to avoid this. And so perhaps we are all hip preservation surgeons, irrespective of what we do or how we try to achieve it. You see, it depends on your point of view, doesn't it? I mean, everything in surgery has a point of view. You have the point of view of the patient, you have the point of view of the surgeon, you have the point of view of the manager, you have the point of view of anybody else. And let's start with the patients. What about the patients? How, what is their point of view? How much do they know? Now, people have looked at this. They've asked patients what they expect 
of what we do for them. And there is no evidence regarding a delay in the need for total hip arthroplasty that patients would find acceptable to undergoing, in this case, hip arthroscopic surgery. So the patients don't really know whether they want the operation to last a week, a year, or a decade. And if you look at the discordance, the disagreement between patients and surgeons, it is there throughout surgery. I know we're talking hips, but here with knees, there is a 37% of patients have expectation scores higher than ours. Here we've got basically a recommendation with something we would probably agree that the advice should be informed by patient reported outcomes rather than our own opinions of the likelihood of success. And with physiotherapists in the audience, I'm sure you get all sorts of discussions and reports about what we think and you think and they think is a success. Now, let me imagine I'm a patient. What am I looking for? I'm looking for no pain. I'm looking for getting back to work. I want to get back to sport. I don't want to have a limp. I want to have a better range of movement. I want to sleep better. I want to be back to normal, please. I don't want to be worse than before I started, and I don't particularly want a hip replacement. I'm a patient. Now I'm a surgeon, what I want. I want the patient to get to recovery. Once they get to recovery, is that a success? I want them to make it home. I want them to get back to sport. I want them to get back to work, maybe. Better at one year, two year, three years. I'm beginning to feel happy. Never hear from them again. Ooh, fantastic. A decent outcome score after surgery. A good looking check x-ray. Not worse than before I started. Have they paid my fee and they haven't sued me? These are things going through my head as a surgeon. Different in large part, to what the patient is thinking. How about the manager? I'm imagining managers in Greece will have the same level of understanding of clinical practice as managers in England. But we've got a short stay. It's cheap. They, it makes money. It's good for the image of the hospital. There are no readmissions. There are no complaints. And that's why this paper was once published. The operation was successful, but the patient died. It depends on how you see it as to what words you use. Let me give you an example. Here I am in London doing a clinic. In walks a 40-year-old male who's a, an information technology consultant. He actually also plays a sport called touch rugby. Okay, he's got that. I say to him, you need a hip arthroscopy. My results of success are 80% better, 15% the same, and 5% worse. I say that to almost every single patient with x-rays like that. But I say to him, and I don't normally say this, at what well, I do now, but I didn't then. I say, but tell me, before we start, what do you expect of me? I've told you what I can do. Now tell me what you want me to do. Okay? So, he writes this. Now, you'll not be able to read this, so let me put it into print. He says, After my perfect operation, I would not require a hip replacement in later life. My mobility would improve, such that I could touch my toes, and I would continue or restart my running, or even play the odd game of football. I would not get hip pain in bed or getting out of the car. I would not feel like a 60 year old. You see, I would like to promise him that, but I cannot promise him that. He has already laid out a, a level, a bar, that I cannot achieve. And so that, to me, was a very important lesson, and I now get every patient to write down what they want me to achieve before we start, just in case it backfires. You see, there is indeed a surgeon-patient disconnect, and our efforts have got to be in that communication to get it right the first time. So what can we say about hip preservation generally and the use of the word preservation? Well, patients can't really tell us what they want. We are unsure what we are preserving. We cannot say if we are delaying hip replacement. Many of the procedures we perform have nothing to do with preservation. And you don't need to be an arthroscopist to be a hip preservation surgeon. So if we go back to Shakespeare, what's in a name? What's in a word? That which we call a rose by any other name, by any other word, would smell as sweet. We each mean something different. Ladies and gentlemen, somehow we need to agree. Thank you very much for being ...of what mild dysplasia might be. Now, the most common marker that we tend to use is the lateral ascender edge ankle. Now, um, according to Weberg, if uh, it's less than 20, then you have front dysplasia. 
If it's more than 25, then it's within normal limits. But we still have this gray area between 20 and 25. Now, the problem with this definition is that it only addresses one factor in a three-dimensional setting. So it doesn't tell us anything about the stubble roof obliquity, anterior, posterior wall cover, and fibula under torsion. Let's see what the papers say. Now, I was fortunate enough preparing this talk that only a year and a half ago we had these two review articles publications looking at the subject. So um, there were about 18 studies in uh, both reviews from 2003 and now, uh, almost a thousand hips, uh, average age of about 35, with a follow-up quite variable between four months to 14 years. Now, keeping in mind, all were retrospective studies or case series. Now, the interarticular find findings in most cases were, as one would expect, labral tears, cartilage lesions, ligamentum tears, um, pathology, and synovitis. Now, this is, so I would say, a typical hip arthroscopy of a mildly dysplastic hip. What you see is, uh, at the very center is you have the ligamentum tears hypertrophy, and you do have a uh, degenerative tear of the ligamentum tears with some associated cartilage uh, lesions around it. Um, at the very center, you also see there's a bit of a sclerosis as the camera goes back uh, at the weight-bearing area of uh, uh, the acetabulum, but overall, it looks uh, quite good. Now, um, the uh, labrum uh, is also uh, a bit of a hypertrophy. It's uh, bigger than expected, but in this case, it's stable. What you do see, though, is that we have what we tend to say a wave sign. A wave sign is the beginning of debonding between uh, the um, chondral surface and the, uh, the, the, uh, the, uh, the uh, uh, chondral surface and the subchondral bone. Uh, so what happened in these papers? Uh, what did arthroscopy do? Well, obviously cannot change the bony alignment, but there was a labral repair. Uh, there was femoral osteochondroplasty if there was FAI. Capsular plication, which we are going to discuss a bit more later on. Labral debridement, ligamentum tears debridement, microfractures. And fortunately, and we'll discuss about that, uh, only a few cases of acetabular rim trimming, because remember, you have uh, mild dysplasia. If you do any rim trimming, uh, it's going to cause actual frank dysplasia and so tendon debridement. In order for one uh, to understand uh, what arthroscopy can do, one should make an effort to understand what we tend now to say instability. Now, uh, in dysplasia or mild dysplasia, you don't have uh, the bony uh, constraint of the acetabulum. And that means that the hip is going to have more degrees of freedom than it usually does. That, in turn, means that um, it's going to uh, cause a bigger strain to the static part of the hip, which is basically the labrum, the ligamentum teres, and the capsule. As time goes by, they're going to generate and they're going to, they're going to cause what we tend to say plastic deformity. And that in turn is going to cause microstability. And that in, again, as a consequence, is going to have for the dynamic stabilizers of the hip, which is mainly the musculature of the hip, to start overworking. That's why in dysplasia or mild dysplasia, one of the first complaints you're going to hear and the patients are going to come to you is because of muscular complaints, iliotibial band, trochanteric bursitis, iliopsoas, etc. Now, uh, we learned a lot from the hip from uh, our shoulder colleagues, and especially in this case from NDI. So uh, there was this nice paper from Ben Dobbs in Chicago where what he did is actually a capsule application, and we're going to discuss that a bit more. Now, the capsule, you have to remember, in the hip, um, the anterior capsule is one of the strongest in the human body. So in order to understand its importance, let's see the catastrophic parts if you don't actually respect this capsule. There have been a number of reports that hip arthroscopy, when you did a big capsulotomy or capsulectomy, for that matter, ended up even in frank dislocation or certainly in disaster of uh, uh, causing um, or uh, uh, bringing arthritis uh, sooner than expected. So if uh, we have to take a lesson from that, it would be that uh, in arthroscopy, you should treat the soft tissues as you would in an open surgery. What are the outcomes? Well, the initial ones were not very good indeed. For example, this paper from Parvizi is a cautionary note. It says basically that uh, hip arthroscopy can make matters worse. But as we started understanding uh, what we're doing, uh, the papers uh, seems that um, things are improving, like in this paper, and this paper basically suggests that you do get good results, uh, clinically at least, um, that are comparable uh, with other cohorts like, for example, FAI. So uh, overall, the results are considered to be good. Um, revision the rate, though, and you have to be um, 
uh, worry about that is quite high. And there's even a 10% chance that hip arthroscopy might fail uh, as a technique, as surgery, uh, and uh, um, bring along a total hip replacement sooner than one would expect. So the outcomes altogether are a bit inferior uh, to what they are in other cohorts of patients. Now this is a very recent paper by Martin Beck from the Journal of Hip Preservation uh, Surgery that I think puts things into place. You see, in borderline hips, he says, the crucial step is to define stability. Regarding the stability of the hip, there are only two conditions. It's either stable or not. If the hip is unstable, hip arthroscopy has nothing to do. Um, is you need a reorientation operation. If the hip is stable, then hip arthroscopy has something to offer. What would be my personal view? Well, I would offer hip arthroscopy on someone depending on the age, okay? Um, depending if there are mechanical symptoms or not. On the bony anatomy, on the patient's expectations. And basically, since we're talking about a gray area, uh, well, uh, our indication is going to be a bit gray. What do I mean? It's uh, the area where dysplasia does not easily justify an open reduction, or it's early osteoarthritis that does not justify a total hip replacement. So what would be the take-home message? First of all, definition of dysplasia, and maybe our radiologist colleagues can help us to that, um, are inconsistent and variable. We're discussing different things. Yes, hip arthroscopy has a place, and it can improve some scores, but it can also um, um, embarrass you in a way that if you don't follow the proper indications, you have higher conversion rate to total hip replacement than expected. And certainly, like everything, such experimental techniques in a way that they need to establish themselves, higher quality of uh, uh, papers and studies are needed to define uh, what borderline displays and what the role of hip arthroscopy is. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for that very elegant and eloquent talk. Now, the next talk is about MIS periacetabular osteotomy. And I think the operations have been done by Sanjeev, but it's Carolyn Alexander, who's his trainee, um, who is going to read the paper. Thank you. Um, so I'm Caroline Blakey. I'm, I've recently finished as um, Mr. Medan's fellow in South Yorkshire, and I've also spent some time in Australia with hip preservation surgeons in Melbourne. Um, thank you for allowing me to give this talk on behalf of Mr. Medan. Um, the title of the talk was Minimally Invasive Periacetabular Osteotomy, so that's what I've focused on. Um, and also, I'm, I'm going to give some outcomes of our, our recent series since Mr. Medan transitioned to the minimally invasive approach. So we've talked already today and yesterday about the natural history of hip dysplasia, and particularly with subluxation, we know that these hips degenerate early. The goals of treatment as a hip preservation surgeon are to identify a hip at risk and then to try and improve pain and function for the patients, to improve stability in order to try and delay progression of arthritis, um, and also to consider improving bone stock for the hip arthroplasty surgeon. Um, when we talk about PAO in this context, we're referring to the, to the Bernese periacetabular osteotomy, first described by um, Professor Gans um, in 19, 1988. Um, and the benefits of the um, Bernese periacetabular osteotomy were that it could be performed through a single approach, and um, that the acetabular blood supply was preserved, and that it had a broad scope, so it could treat complex deformities with a, um, a, a good range of correction. But it's thought to be technically demanding and prone to complications. And it just demonstrates the osteotomies in 3D. So the original um, description included a, an osteotomy of the anterior superior iliac spine, taking the inguinal ligament and sartorius medially, and then followed with osteotomies of the, of the pubis, um, just medial to the iliopectineal eminence, scoring the ischium at the infracotyloid fossa. So this just is demonstrating a complete osteotomy here. To scoring the issue, I'm an incomplete osteotomy. And then followed by um, an osteotomy of both sides of the um, ileum and an incomplete osteotomy of the, perios of the posterior column. Um, and these homins are protecting um, the sciatic nerve and also the abductor musculature. And here we can see how the position of the leg during the performance of the osteotomies um, can affect the position of the sciatic nerve. 
and careful attention needs to be paid to this in order to protect the nerve during the um, osteotomy of the lateral side of the posterior column. And it allows 3D correction of quite significant deformities. A chance pin is used to mobilize the fragment and a second point of fixation prevents retroversion. And then the, um, depending on the deformity, we're looking for medialization, anterior coverage, and usually lateral coverage um, with external rotation of the fragment. And so classically, um, this, this, the GANS osteotomy was um, performed through a modified Smith-Peterson approach or through um, an ilio-inguilin approach or for a two-approach technique. Um, initially, the, the abductors were taken off, and, and as was the rectus femoris. Um, the Miller, Mike Millis and the Boston group have um, described um, approaches where the abductors were preserved and the rectus femoris tendon was preserved. Um, and then in 2008, Sabali um, published a minimally invasive transitorial approach for the periacetabular osteotomy. And it's this um, approach that Mr. Medan has been using since approximately 2013. And since then, we have about 92 hips of pure DDH. So this is excluding patients with perthes or with cerebral palsy with other conditions over two hospitals. Uh, careful attention to patient selection. Some um, centres are doing this in, in younger patients. We have been doing these in skeletally mature patients. Um, we like them all to have a positive response to an intraarticular injection prior to surgery. Um, and we're cautious about what we know are negative predictors of surgery. So considering the age, um, preoperative stiffness, any preoperative um, osteoarthritis, and cautious about hip subluxation. Um, Preoperative planning is important. We've already talked about this. Um, looking at a well-centered film, the symmetrical height of the obturator foramen, and looking at the um, sacrum being directly over it, slightly rotated in this film, but over the symphysis, so that you know you're getting um, adequate representation of your angles. Um, we like a standing X-ray to look at the anterior and posterior wall. And then um, standard measurements of, of dysplasia, so sharps angle, tonus acetabular roof angle, and the lateral center edge angle. And then also looking at the false profile view for your anterior center edge angle. Thinking about subluxation, not that it can't be done in these patients, but just um, to consider whether you need to do a femoral osteotomy or whether um, we need to counsel the patients regarding worse outcomes in these situations. Um, and we would routinely do a CT pelvis and rotational profile of the patient to, to look at um, sphericity and congruency of the hip and also um, the version of the femur. Abduction views are useful um, when you're considering about whether you need to do a proximal femoral osteotomy in the same sitting. So this is the Sibali technique. It's a, um, difficult to demonstrate through the nature of it being minimally invasive, but it's um, through what he described as a seven centimeter incision. Natural femoral container's nerve is identified in the interval and preserved. And then um, the um, internal ileum is exposed to the, the um, the inguinal ligament is dissected from the ASIS um, and the sartorius split in line with its fibres to take medially. Um, the osteotomies are then are performed in sequence as previously described by Gans. Um, the ischium is approached through the interval between the hip capsule and the, rectus, and the psoas tendon and then in order as we've described. Um, these images, sorry, it's difficult to demonstrate the approach, but these just show um, the position of the retractors in the um, sciatic notch when you're doing your ileal cuts um, and the use of the false profile view to show you your osteotomy of the posterior column. The Shans pin is then used um, to crack the posterior column osteotomy and to allow mobilization of the fragment. And then those um, three steps of correction, the medial, uh, medialization, lateral rotation, and anterior coverage, depending on your um, nature of your deformity. Positioning is confirmed, and, and we use um, 4.5 fully threaded screws to, to fix the, the osteotomy. So this is just a summary. Um, seven centimeter incision, protecting the nerve. Um, inguinal ligament is cut, but the sartorius is split in line with its fibers, and the rectus femoris is preserved. <coughs> 
The advantages are, are published as a more cosmetic skin incision, incision, but more than that, that there's less soft tissue trauma and a limited time on exposure um, with comparable outcomes to previous approaches. The limitations are that if through this approach you can't do an intraarticular surgery, you'd need to extend it. Um, and it's really recommended for surgeons who have experience of periastabular osteotomy already and that are, um, are confident with the osteotomies themselves. So just looking at uh, um, the series from South Yorkshire, um, with 92 hips and 82 patients, predominantly female, um, a varied age range. Um, and this was from one of Savali's originally paper, original papers. So he compared his earlier ilioinguinal approach versus his minimally invasive. And then these are our results at the end. We did have slightly higher blood loss and the transfusion rate was higher. Um, but we need to look at what our indications for transfusion were. It seems to be a, a greater transfusion rate compared to the amount of blood loss. But our corrections that were achieved were comparable to his minimally invasive approach. Um, we looked at our complications using the Clavin and Dindo um, classification, uh, focusing on grade three or four major complications. We didn't have any grade four. The grade three complications, we had two posterior column non-unions requiring re revision, and these were in older patients, um, one of them a smoker, and we had two infections requiring washouts. There were no major nerve injuries, and our lesser grade complications were comparable to previous series. So the MIS um, periastabular osteotomy has been shown to be a safe modification of the technique, um, but use of this technique requires a good understanding of the osteotomy and the re reorientation that we're trying to achieve. Thank you. Next uh, talk is by uh, uh, Mr. O'Hara. You know him very well, no introduction is needed. Uh, so he, he has immense experience in uh, BIPO, which is a Birmingham interlocking pelvic osteotomy. He devised this, devised this osteotomy. It's a very elegant osteotomy and actually one which has to be uh, revisited and learned. Thank you uh, for your uh, wise wisdom here. Thank you. Uh, thanks very much for the opportunity to speak to you about something completely different. And the reason I say it's completely different is because a lot of people in this room will only have heard about the Gantz perias tabular osteotomy and will have not considered any other way of achieving the same result or perhaps, as you may see here, something slightly better. I have no commercial interest in this except that I run a website called the Hip Clinic and that probably attracts the odd patient. Um, our osteotomy is a triple osteotomy of the pelvis. Well, the maldirection is defined as accord to, to, according to Turner's criteria, which I told you about yesterday. And this very first operation started off as a Turner's triple osteotomy, and this is effectively a, 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 a modification of it. Three interlinked cuts are made on the ileum, reflecting the presenting deformity to be corrected. So this means that if you want to get a 30 degree lateral rotation of the centralized tabular fragment, these cuts are at 30 degrees to one another. We also use a leg length here marked by the points of introduction of the shant screws here. And the line of the leg length and the angle of inclination of the shant screws is a reflection of a preoperative analysis of the femur. Of the, of the acetabulum on scans. Now, 30% of these patients, by the way, have also had contemporaneous femoral osteotomies to produce 20 degrees of antiversion and some other modifications as well as required. The overall principle is to use the Elizarov technique to take a leg length attached to the central acetabular fragment and return it to a position of predictable correction, permitting immediate weight bearing and rapid mobilization. And this is a summary of what the interoperative technique would look like. Now, the indications are the same as everybody else's. One point I would say is upon advice from Dietrich Turnus, labral tears and other interoperative pathology were ignored. And to my knowledge, and Richard may have picked up a patient or two of mine, I'm only aware of one patient in my first 100 that ever needed any subsequent intraoperative, intraarticular surgery such as arthroscopy. In exactly the same way as I said yesterday, the overall alignment of your bones is critical to the longevity of your articular cartilage. <laughs>
Now, the, the cuts you see here, the three equal cuts, give a strong interlock but prevent antiversion adjustment. So, you see here, up where these corners come together and the corner between the quadrilateral place and the BC angle come together here, that provides a very strong immediate interlock and will permit full weight bearing immediately. Now, for um, those of us doing younger patients, I have also etched in the position of the triradial cartilage. And because the center of rotation of the central acetabular fragment is higher than the center of rotation of the femoral head, this produces an automatic and proportionate effortless medialization of the central acetabular fragment and the center of articulation, so producing a much more normal hip, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. So the cuts themselves are about four or five centimeters deep, and when you were considering doing antiversion correction, you see on the left side the application of a leg length now with the desire to reduce acetabular antiversion by about 10 degrees, and on the right, you can see the leg length or horizontal, and you can see how the position of the shant screw has moved. This is what we intend to achieve. Now, to achieve that, it is necessary to slightly change the bone cut. And in other words, we make the C cut slightly shorter, the B cut slightly longer, and this difference can be as little as three or four millimeters, and anything between three and five millimeters of difference will allow you to adjust antiversion by about 10 degrees, and that, for the most, pair, most part, is satisfactory. And you see here, the difference in the width here allows you some side-to-side -side movement of the central acetabular fragment. And you see here another graphic showing how internal rotation of the central acetabular fragment or external rotation can be achieved by having these differences in the width of the bone cuts. The pubic osteotomy is performed as obliquely as possible. It should be at least two centimeters long, as you see in this view here, with a view to getting bone contact when it has moved. Here's an interoperative picture. Uh, there are some special instruments here, and I would point out to you there's a very special retractor which we call a sciatic notch retractor here, which gives broad protection of the sciatic nerve with a single retractor from the medial side. And on the lateral, there is a broad homen and no abductor dissection. And you can see here the outline of where the bone cuts are going to be, the outline of where the leg length is going to be. That's number one screw, that's number two screw. And here you see a little bit more of it with the, some of the graphic removed. Here you see it intraoperatively, and you'll understand it's quite difficult to photograph. The cuts are made with a reciprocating saw. Here's the application of a leg lengthener, and the leg lengthener, which was firstly subtending an angle of 30 degrees, is now subtending an angle of zero, representing a horizontal weight-bearing zone. And the leg lengthener is then transposed to the opposite side of the patient and handed to the assistant who is blamed for any subsequent malposition of the operation. We have only actually had that happen three times in 1,700 cases. Um, so you see the bone cuts interlinked here, the A, B, and C cuts on the central acetabric fragment and the A, B, and C cuts on the proximal allium. And here is what it looks like on a saw bones. That's a rather paltry place which you wouldn't normally use, but because we were in some other hospital, it's all they were able to give us. And here is what it looks like. And this is using a four-hole plate. Normally, I'd use a three-hole plate. Uh, that gives tremendous purchase and allows immediate weight bearing. The 6.5 millimeter screw here is inserted through the number one external fixator screw hole. You're just reusing the same screw hole, producing a tremendous vertical compression across the principal osteotomy site between these components. And that is all that is required to allow full weight bearing immediately. So in our starting off doing this operation and checking with Dietrich Turnus how we were doing, he advised us to do some post-operative scans. And you can imagine that there would be some ethical problems with this. But what we did was every January, every patient was being seen at about two to three monthly intervals in their first year after their operation. And every January from 1992 to 97, we sent every patient that came to the clinic off for a post-operative CT scan. 
with a note on the uh, request form saying post-operative pain. Now, none of these patients had post-operative pain, but it conned the radiologist into doing the, in into doing the investigation. So we effectively did post-operative CT scans on 25% of our patients. Here's a preoperative x-ray. Here's a preoperative scan showing excessive acetabular antiversion by 10 degrees on both sides. And here's a post-operative x-ray. And here's a post-operative scan showing perfect achievement of acetabular antiversion. One other thing that we also achieved, but we weren't looking too carefully at the time, is we achieved no anterior displacement of the uh, center of articulation, whereas anterior displacement of the center of articulation is a major problem with the GANS PAO. So our first 100 patients were identified, 116 hips. Primary outcome was survival before a low threshold for arthroplasty, and most of these patients had hip resurfacings. And then, of course, we looked at the Oxford HIP score and the UCLA score. This is a rather busy slide, but effectively, if you look down a little bit, you look at 37 arthroplasties as a mean of seven years. And these are our first consecutive 100, 100 patients. This is not, not our second consecutive 100 patients. This is actually our first consecutive. Now, here we have one revision here in 2008, 14 years later for excessive acetabular antiversion, and another excessive uh, anterior cover, which required a little bit of acetabular edge trimming. So in other words, in our first 100 patients, those two patients escaped the post-operative scan, but all the other patients did not need any adjustment. Now these are the complications, and you can see they are not too frightening. Uh, one pulmonary embolism actually was due to a flight uh, 12 days earlier, one other DVT, three non-unions, all of which did quite well. Our first patient had a sciatic nerve neuropraxia, and Dietrich Turner's pointed out to me that I needed to mobilize the sciatic nerve a great deal more carefully than I did. And two of those patients have had some permanent disturbance to the uh, lateral cutaneous nerve. That doesn't seem to be too bad. One patient had a deep infection which was treated with a washout and six weeks of antibiotics. This is the patient whose slide you're looking at behind the print. Here's our Kaplan-Meier survivor curve for dysplasia with a relatively low threshold for arthroplasty. And there are two things. Firstly, you can see that above the age of 30 years, the survivorship is worse. Ending between 25 years or less, the survivorship is very good and the survivorship has genuinely been level in all of those patients for the last five years, which is rather reassuring. Now, we've also looked at their Oxford HIP scores and their UCLA scores. Here's just an example of a six-year-old child with a, neonatic, a neonatal septic dislocation. This is the first time that I saw an X-ray of her, and we did that operation on her in 1993. So she's somewhere around 25 years down the line, and that's the most recent x-ray of her. And it clearly can be seen that this hip is going to need arthroplasty sometime, but altogether it's not too embarrassing. Um, now, since 1992, I've done 1,700 of these of my own, many of them in the private sector, and maybe another 900 have been done by three junior colleagues of mine. And you see here a typical combination. The patient first came in with a short leg due to um, Perthes disease, and I first did a bit of adjustment on the left side, turning the socket and the femur exactly the same number of degrees. I was unable to um, match her leg lengths. It wasn't technically possible without causing incongruity. And on the opposite side, she had acetabular dysplasia anyway. Now, you see various salient features here. One of the salient features is you see where the screws were for the leg length no? on both sides. No problem whatsoever. You see also here an inferior Chiari sort of effect. By having the pubic osteotomy as close as it can be to the um, medial side of the hip joint, you get an inferior Chiari effect, which I think is probably beneficial to when you're later doing a hip arthroplasty. Now, altogether, in those 1,700 patients of mine, there have been four sciatic nerve neuropraxias. There have been five further non-unions requiring bone grafting. 
Two patients need the pubis and ischium uh, grafted, one from Essex and one from Liverpool. If anybody knows any others that needed grafted, I'd be grateful to know. And most interestingly, most interestingly a colleague's patient recently, recently fell down a flight of stairs in the first five weeks after this operation, and no movement took place in the osteotomy because the interlock was so good. And it's been used in dysplasia, active Perthes disease, and fully remodeled Perthes disease here, and also occasionally with open reduction and femoral shortening in high dislocations. So our conclusion is it's quite a useful and accurate tool. We are very skeptical about the importance of labral or intra-articular pathology once the socket has been corrected. And the complications were lower than in any published series of the Gans Bernese PAO. Now I'm going to challenge a little bit the Gans PAO religion. It is performed a lot. It's widely performed. People are very persistent about it and they keep going at it despite huge complication rates. Malposition in Gans's own hands was 14%. Now I'm just going to show you some papers presented at ISHA in the last couple of weeks, and I'm asking you to take off your blinkers and look around. This is Gans's own series of preoperative hip pain and function and what the long-term outcome was of those patients published in Channel Clinical Orthopedics last year. The predictors for failure you can see were dependent upon the turnus grade, the age of the patient, the poor preoperative clinical scores, and of course, optimal acetabular orientation and a spherical head. I'm going to look at that more closely next. Here is their own graph for, with the sort of um, light brown color up here, the light brown color up here is optimal acetabular reorientation and a spherical head. And the more maroon, the dirty maroon color here is non-optimal acetabular reorientation and a non-spherical head. And it shows basically that if you don't get it right, it doesn't do well. Now I have to say this was a very honest paper and our BPO follow-up only goes to 20 years, although it'll be another two or three years now since we published, so there's a few more years of follow-up. But do you see here the sheer number of steps in the decline of the patients that were non-optimally orientated? I counted 33 steps here. And thus must mean that 33 of their first 80-odd patients had inaccurate position of the acetabulum. That seems to me like pretty poor, frankly, considering the work that Turners had done when Gans had started off. And if you look at our slope here, I'm just going back and forth in the slides, I think we are seeing a good result from our operation because of a much better level of reproducibility of the operation. Now here are a list of five panels of papers presented at ISHA about problems after PAO. And I just want to look at a few of them. On the left here you see you know, femoral aversion, how much does it matter? And after that, arthroscopic surgery for femoral torsion deformity, how far can I go? Which clearly shows a complete failure to understand the proper treatment for a femoral rotation abnormality. On the right here are patients that were investigated after PAOs looking at the orientation of the joint. And the top one here is about PAO does not improves but does not normalize joint mechanics in hip dysplasia. The third one down was that although medialization of the acetabular center of rotation occurred following PAO, it occurred as a result of anterior displacement of the central acetabular fragment, which of course is fundamentally undesirable because many patients who have dysplasia start off with a slight anterior displacement of the acetabulum anyway. And the next paper down showed something very similar. So essentially, these papers showed that although the PAO can make the AP look, X-ray look well, and although it's possible to get a PAO to work well and to get a reasonable attempt at as tabular antiversion being optimal, it's by no means certain. 
And down in the last one here, variability in anterior, interior, inferior, iliac spine, spine morphology and a source of uh, post-osteotomy impingement. And I looked at that and I said to myself, I have never seen that problem. And I probably have never seen that problem because we've been putting the socket in the right place. Now, the problems about the PAO lie in the posterior cut, and I ask you to remove your blinkers and think laterally. The posterior cut for a PAO is somewhere here. But if you imagine now what you're trying to do, which is to displace the acetabulum medially, the obliquity of that cut prevents the central acetabular fragment moving medially unless you move it anteriorly. That is self-evident. So if you want to move it medially, you have to move it anteriorly at the same time. And I would suggest that if you want to achieve a true medialization of a PAO without getting inadvertent anterior displacement, that cut needs to be in the coronal plane. And until it goes into the coronal plane, you're all going to be looking at these post-operative scans and wondering where you went wrong. Well, I think I'm suggesting to you where you did go wrong. So let's take off the blinkers again. For all of those who still think you should be doing a GANS PAO, just look at these saw bones. On the right is one, I did it with a saw, I pre-drilled the holes, and despite my best efforts to do it with a saw, you'll see a posterior column cut, posterior column propagation, more or less inevitable. And this results in unavoidable posterior hitching, anterior overcoverage, and medialization only being possible with anterior displacement. And there's lots of gaps, and that's why you have to get the patients to partially weight bear. And in comparison, a Birmingham interlocking osteotomy is finished, fixed simply and allows immediate weight bearing. Now, I've been involved in some defense of surgeons who've done PAOs in Great Britain. I don't know whether you have litigation here, but I've defended five surgeons so far. And in comparison with that, in my own 1,700 cases, there hasn't been any, uh, anything beyond a complaint from one patient who needed their socket antiversion changing 14 years later, but not litigation. So, five PAOs so far. Um, they all had malposition. Four of them were retroverted. One was excessively antiverted. All of them had a posterior column hitch and a posterior column discontinuity, even though we're all being told that the posterior column must remain intact. And all were defended successfully by me simply because I was able to show that as Gantz himself had a 14% malposition rate, excusing the ordinary folk from having a higher malposition rate wasn't too hard because all the scientific da data pointed in a direction to defend the surgeon. But I would say to you that are doing PAOs, couldn't you improve on this? Or are you going to go on doing this operation that's A, a struggle, and B, doesn't give you a perfect reproducible position? And ask yourself now, how many post-operative scans have you done, and what do they look like, and did you look at them honestly? Now let's take the blinkers off again. Gantz in Google Translate from German to English means all or everything, and I'm just saying to you, isn't this all a bit too much to be continuing doing this operation? Thank you. I would like to thank you very much for the invitation. And uh, also, I would like to congratulate the previous speakers for excellent talks they uh, gave us uh, regarding uh, uh, complications of, uh, especially the, the, the last speaker, about the complications of gun cystotomy. The dialostotomy is a, is a procedure that is not uh, very much in use, or not, the, 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 uh, it's, it's a procedure that has, been, uh, has, has not been performed by many people. I was fortunate to train in Houston, in Texas, where I was able to work with uh, uh, Dick Epright, who was actually the person who invented this. And, uh, um, uh, in his original article in 1975, he, uh, he actually uh, uh, um, explains the procedure. This was a, a, a very demanding procedure, kind of, and the whole concept of, of, uh, of the uh, of the or osteotomy version, where you actually try to rotate the acetabulum to contain the femoral head, 
Um, <clears throat> and it was uh, very uh, uh, unique in the sense that in order for us to perform this procedure, we had to use some specific circular kind of oscillating saws that he had personally developed and he would carry them around in the hospital whenever we had to do the procedure. So this is basically there's the same concept but not the exact same procedure that we've seen in other periastabilist osteotomies. And I was very privileged to work with them and, and see the results. I, I was also lucky in, in my times of training where we could uh, have endless uh, discussions uh, with uh, him about uh, the uh, Bernese osteotomy or the periastable osteotomy performed by Professor Gantz in, 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 in uh, Bern uh, and the arguments they would have uh, regarding which one would be better or not or not so. Um, so the, the, the problem lies in the, in the sense of uh, what is a painful hip. We have uh, two, uh, either a hip dysplasia could cause a, a painful hip. Fortunately, in our times, uh, <clears throat> uh, hip dysplasia is not so common, and most people would be uh, uh, identified early. The, most, uh, the, the, the children, the, the newborns are identified early, so this is not a disease of our time anymore, or at least it's much more limited. Uh, what is uh, much uh, uh, in vogue or very much uh, uh, <clears throat> seen in our days is the FAI with femoral stabber impingement, which is kind of very much in, 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 in vogue, as I said, in, in, in our recent times. People overdiagnose it. They talk about a shallow acetabulum. They talk about the, the, the sense of, uh, of, of uh, not enough coverage of the femoral head. We could, th this is something we have seen in the older days <clears throat> when we would see patients and then we, we, if we followed the x-rays years back, we would see that um, the, the femoral head was not very much contained. But this is a common picture. I mean, if, if, we, if we, all the patients that come to our office, adults, more or less, they have such an x-ray or close to that. I haven't seen many patients that have perfect coverage. And the more athletics they do, and, and, and in our times, most people are involved with sports, they put uh, uh, the, 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 the hip in, in, in a lot of strain, and eventually sports like tennis with the open stance, uh, st stance when, they, when they hit the ball, they put a lot of strain in the hips, which eventually ends up in, in, in more uh, exaggeration of the symptoms. So anyway, <clears throat> if we have a symptomatic or dysplastic or retroverted acetabulum, what are we gonna do? We have two choices, either we do an osteotomy or we have to eventually uh, wait for this patient to end up with a, a hip replacement. Hopefully not for a young patient, but the osteotomy, I mean, you know, after we have, uh, uh, after the patient has been past the initial stages. So if we have uh, some uh, indications that, that, that are leading to, uh, are actually exceeding uh, the plain osteotomy, such as if the patient is older than 50 years old, if he, de if he does, if he, she he do have osteoarthritis, if the joint space is actually getting narrowed, or the patient has a reduced range of motion, I think the osteotomy is not the best choice for these patients, and, and they will do poorly, no matter which one we choose. The next question is which one to do, and, and we have seen that there's a, a million osteotomies available in the market, and, and uh, uh, th that actually by itself, uh, as we go down, we, we, th these are osteotomies that are performed uh, in, in older people, uh, in, 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 in adults. Uh, we, we see that most of this, uh, uh, the, the fact that we do have so many osteotomies, that actually means that none of them are like a perfect procedure. And we've seen that in many other aspects of, of, uh, of, of other surgical fields when we actually try to, to deal with a problem and then we end up with a lot of procedures to do this, that means that we haven't been able to find the perfect, the perfect way to deal with those patients. So the, the, undoubtedly, this is a, these are good procedures in the way that we delay the, 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 the inevitable, but at one point or another, most of these patients will, will end up uh, having the, 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 the final procedure, which is uh, uh, the hip replacement. So the, 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 the people develop periastabular osteotomies, understanding that the problem lies within the coverage of the, of the femoral head within the astabulum. So they, they try to figure, they, they understand that, that the hip coverage is not sufficient, and they try to figure out a way how to, to actually rotate the astabulum to 
provide a better coverage of the femoral head. So the Bernese, the, the periastomy, the, the dialastotomy, where did I put this now? No, I have this one, it's working. So we can see m m many, many ways. The, 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 the advantage of the dialastotomy is that it actually preserves all the columns of the, of the, of the, of the, of the, of the pelvis. And that's talking to, to, to Dick Upright at the time. It was, uh, uh, that was his concept, that we had to perform an astotomy that would actually embrace the femoral head and, 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 and cut the bone around it and then we can rotate the whole thing, maintaining the columns stable without actually losing that, uh, that, that, that stability of the spine. So this is quite demanding and, and very, very difficult to perform. The fact that it's not be, being performed by many people, it's, it's that it, it technically was very, very hard. I remember him in the operating room where we actually did the procedure. He, he, everybody, anybody had seen the movie Poltergeist. So it's like the bad guy in the movie is like a very, imagine a Texan guy, very thin, tall, with his boots on, and his fingers like about a yard long. So he could actually put his fingers around the notch, and he could feel uh, uh, around the whole thing, and, and, then, and then he could put his uh, uh, osteotomes around, being able to, act, to know whether he had penetrated or not the bone with his fingers. So if you don't have long fingers, it's very hard to truly perform this procedure. And it's not a joke, it's a fact. And uh, we've tried to do it many, many times. And, and if you didn't have his instruments, it was very hard. And we try to do it with plain osteotomes. It's very, very hard to perform because you do have to make a circular shape cut. And, and that's what makes, that, and, that, and that, that's where the dial name came from. So, <clears throat> And uh, the approaches, most approaches for all the periastabulostomes ostatums are not the same. We used to do a modified uh, uh, femoral, uh, iliofemoral approach, but you can do an ilioengonal approach with um, a small modification or a, a Smith-Pedersen approach, a modified Smith-Pedersen approach. The, the, the fact is that you have to be able to see the hip from the front, be able to identify the uh, true borders, uh, the, 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 the end of the anterior column where the pubic, uh, where the brain would start, so you can actually perform the medial cut, and, uh, uh, and, 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 and you, you should be able to actually see the uh, ilium as well, so you can actually do the main cuts. So, the, the key is to, uh, to, to identify the, uh, to, to strip down all the muscles, get to the sciatic notch, so you can actually be able to uh, put your finger around and feel the, 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 the posterior wall of the astabum so you don't penetrate it with your retractors, with, uh, you, with your os, uh, osteotomes. Um, the key, the key, the, 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 last, the, la the last sign is the key to the whole procedure is like you have to be able to maintain a one centimeter roof uh, separating the, uh, the, uh, the articular surface, from, I mean a, a roof over the articular surface so that you can actually don't cause uh, osteonecrosis of the fragment and be able to reduce it. So once you've done the, the cuts, then you rotate the fragment. The, uh, 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 laterally, sort of, and, and anterior and laterally, so you can cover the the femoral head, and, and then you can actually put, we used to put, and, and, and you can put diamond pins in order to hold the, uh, the, the fragment in place. Um, you know, if you get those uh, uh, results at the end, I think it's an excellent result, I'm not sure. Uh, whether we were able to get them all the time, but the majority of the patients that we, we, we deal with are young adults that actually have an advanced uh, 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 lesion and that you don't have many other choices other than either to wait for, an, uh, 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 for uh, performing a total hip replacement or to actually uh, do something to gain some time. And uh, I, that, that was a pretty good um, uh, solution, at least at the time. Uh, when we do the pre-op workup, we do get x-rays and uh, AP and frog lateral views. We measure the angles, the uh, center edge angle, so we can actually make sure that, that evaluate the, the, 
the, uh, the coverage of the head and the uh, ASTABER index. Also, we, we, we hope to see uh, a, good, uh, a, a good femoral neck and, and, and shaft angle so that actually this helps the, 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 femoral, the, the, femoral, the femoral head stay uh, uh, contained in the ASTABER. What is important is to always maintain a, a, good, a good joint line because if the joint line, if the joint space has already been decreased significantly, then you won't be able, <coughs> I mean, arthritis has already started and it's very hard to maintain a good result long term. Uh, using classifications of uh, several systems, busy slides, but everybody knows those. And again, what are the radiographic findings of a, a severity of arthritis in order to make sure that we decide what kind of procedure to do and whether to do this kind of procedure. And then at the end, this is more or less a, a, a result that you get. So um, the, the key here is, so you, you get the uncovered version and then you make the circular astotomy sort of like this and you try to cover the, 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 the head. This is, uh, held in place with stymon pins and, and hopefully this will heal soon enough. Um, majority, majority of the, uh, of the, of the, of the uh, literature that comes comes from many other sources as, as we heard from the previous speaker is uh, the Bernese osteotomy that has the results, uh, uh, the follow-ups. Uh, the Japanese actually come back with uh, a whole bunch of uh, procedures like this, and they're very, very famous. The problem was always, and, and, and uh, uh, the, the, not only do they do rotational osteotomies around the acetabulum, but they also do rotational osteotomies of the proximal femur. Uh, that was a uh, most people used to do valgus or virus osteotomies, depending on the case. They would do also a rotational version. The results were, the, 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 the problem was always that the results that they had seen in their own papers and in their work was not uh, reproduced in other people's work. Uh, uh, maybe that was a, a lack of technical ability from the, remain, from the rest of the world or uh, 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 problems in, in, in presentations of the, of the data. So uh, we, we do have, that we, we do see that uh, the results scores uh, in, uh, most hip high risk hip scores improved in most cases from 70 to 88 points. Uh, uh, in their series, 20 years down the line, many hips will, you, you see already had uh, simultaneous and tro trochanteric valgus osteotomy. Was, as I said before, many of them will also have rotational osteotomy to change their femoral head coverage in a rotational version, not only in the AP view, but in the uh, posterior, pos uh, anterior posterior view. Um, other scores, other, other studies that come up, they, they, also, they all show uh, an improvement in the high risk keep, in, the, in, the, in the different scores used uh, in each study. Uh, results fall in about 20 years, so I'm sorry it doesn't show very well, but this is pretty much like uh, the slide that was, we, we saw before that we see in the patients that had the uh, pre arthritis group, the survival rate was about 96% at 10 years and 20 years almost. And then if we do have early stages of arthritis, the survival rate falls about 78% at 20 years. It, um, uh, the Bernays osteotomy, as we heard before, is, is one that actually translates the joints immediately, the, uh, the joints sent immediately. Uh, very hard procedure and it actually, you have to make a lot of cuts and I'm not sure it's reproducible by the rest of the world and those results that we have seen are very much reproducible. Uh, the, the people from Bern have come out with a, a whole bunch of uh, uh, <coughs> algorithms of how to treat those uh, conditions. And we see uh, 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 in, in the, the scenario in which case hips are insufficiently covered with a normal joint space and uh, what, you are to, what, what you should do, you get a view, then if, if it's a congruent joint, you do a, a, a uh, 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 alone. If it's not, and if it's a non-congruent uh, uh, hip, then you have, uh, if uh, you do an abduction and internal rotation view, if this is congruent, you just do a, a periastable osteotomy first, followed by a proximal femoral osteotomy. If it's non-congruent, then you have to do the opposite. Uh, the same, uh, this is a more complicated slide, it, 
in a situation where you, the joint space is also involved, uh, there's a, another. Uh, there, there's also a big uh, uh, algorithm. So overall, this is uh, th this is what I had to say about the, uh, uh, the dial periastatotomy is, is a hard procedure to perform, and I think this is why most people never never actually got into it, and they uh, were interested in, in, in more con in, in other in other types of approach. But the concept is about the same. And uh, for all those patients, we do have a shallow and, 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 and uh, shallow acetabulum that does not cover very well the femoral, the femoral head. We need to come up with something that will cover the head so that we can actually maintain this joint as long as we can before these patients end up having uh, a, a more definitive procedure such as the tall hip arthroplasty, which is okay for an older person, but for a young adult is not so okay. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much. It's going to be like an introductory talk for the much anticipated talk by Mr. Nicolaou, which is going to be much more impressive and uh, scientific. Now, where is the black thing? We're going to talk about SCIFI, the slipped capital femoral epiphysis. So, how is the initial approach in a hospital like ours? or in the simple cases before we reach to the complications that can, might lead to FAI or AVN. So th there are five pediatric orthopedic problems that should get you out of bed at night. And one of these is an unstable Sufi that needs an urgent treatment before you reach the AVN or the FAI. What is SUFI or SCIFI, or whatever? Like it's not that the head of the femur slips out of place, it's that the neck of the femur comes anteriorly and superiorly uh, relative to the epiphysis, relative to the head, which stays in the acetabulum. So in order to do the best treatment, we need an accurate diagnosis and a proper classification to find out what are we going to do. This is a typical picture that shows you that the way the head gets off place is like the ice cream and the cone, like the child that the ice cream falls off the cone. So it's more common in obese children, although this is challenged by latest by some articles more common to males. Fortunately, it used to be much more common to males, but nowadays they come into uh, three to one. In some specific ethnicities, like the Pacific Islanders or the Africans, and usually it's a disease of the high school during the period of the rapid growth uh, between 10 and 15 years old. The problem is that we still have a late diagnosis, not only because of the waiting list, as another speaker said earlier, but also because the, this child may not limp early or might have this type of pain that could be confused with growing pains or due to injuries in athletic sport. So we have to have a, in mind that we need to catch early the proper diagnosis. Why it's, is it happening? We don't really know. Could be a relatively weak physis, or could be the perimostum weaker. Could be, is it a skin uh, uh, obesity a risk factor? Is it the growth spurt? We don't really know about that. We know that happens through the hypertrophic zone of the physis. It's where we find that the perichondrial uh, ring is usually thin and weaker. In similar to a Salter Harris type 1 fracture, but the difference is that we have an intact periosteum. And that's why when we have a chronic sleep, then we have a rapid uh, callus formation, and that's why we should not, in a chronic uh, sleep, we should, do a, we should not do a reduction. How do we get to a diagnosis? It's not so obvious as in these cases. 
Of course, always a clinical examination. We see the typical sign that when we do a hip flexion, the hip goes to an external rotation. Usually, it starts as a knee pain. It's very common. The limp is not always common, but when it's a late diagnosis, the child always comes with a limp when it's a chronic. And we come to the imaging, which is the easiest and cheapest way to start with. We need two x-rays. We need the supine AP pelvic view and the frog lateral view, where we can see signs like a widening of the physis, like the so-called pre-sleep sign, or if we cannot see any sign, then we MRI surely shows more things, but as we saw in one of our papers, ultrasound might help. Ultrasound can show an effusion, and also you can see here on the arrow the obvious sleep of the femoral head. But what we usually do on the next ray is we drive, uh, we draw this uh, client's line, which uh, intersects the head, or does not even intersect the head. It's, the head is lower than this client line compared to the other normal side. I'm not going to go through the other sides. But what the, user, the angle that we are all taught in uh, our training to measure, it's the Southwick angle where we measure on a frog lateral uh, radiograph to determine the degree of the sleep. It's calculated, uh, as you see here, on the axis, the vertical on the axis of the, the base of the femoral head, but we subtract the normal side. So this is not the angle, the angle is 37. So we subtract the normal side. There is a classification depending on this same angle about the degree, so mild below 30 de degrees, moderate and severe. There is a graded system according to the percentage of the slippage. There is the loader classification who is the best known uh, name for papers on these conditions as stable and unstable and another classification according to when did this happen but it's not much in use nowadays. Mechanical stability of the physis is considered to be the most important clinical factor to consider whether we treat it, whether we reduce it or not. But the intraoperative findings of open reduction has shown that the stability, we cannot consider stability according to clinical examination because in the old days they used to say that when a child can stand on the affected uh, leg, then it's stable. But papers have shown that through intraoperative findings that those hips considered stable, they are not really stable, so they needed treatment. And what is this treatment? What's the best evidence for the treatment? Loader himself in a review paper says that the best treatment for sleep capital ephemesis is a single screw in situ, and for unstable skiffies we need an end a gentle reduction, decompression of the joint by aspiration or a small mini arthrotomy, and eternal fixation with single screw. Mind, keep in mind that this paper is a bit biased towards single screw fixation. He's in favor of that. However, this in a general hospital like ours or in the majority of the orthopedic surgeons, this is the gold standard, a single screw fixation. So the, our entry has to be anterolateral. We, use, we put the screws percutaneous. We did large cannulated screws, but in a chronic sleep, bear in mind, we don't attempt a close reduction, as I said before. We use the, during our surgical technique, we draw and show you how. The, pa the patient is on a traction table. We draw a line, we put the, uh, our guide wire uh, 
on the AP view, we draw the line where it should be the desired position, and we, we draw it on the patient, and then we go to the frog lateral view. We, the screw should be in the center of the head, irrespective of the position of the femur. So we draw a line again on the lateral position, and where those lines intersect, this is our entry point, which we put the guide wire, and we advance the guide wire, check it all the time on AP and frog lateral views, aiming at the center of the head, always. And then when we have achieved the perfect positioning, or close to perfect, we advance the screw. The screw has to pass six, six passes uh, after the uh, six threads after the physis and not very close to the cartilage because of the possibility of the chondrolysis. How many screws and what type of screws? A long discussion. In the old days, they used uh, K wires or Steinman pins. There are newly designed screws with proximal threads. Two screws is a possibility for a very unstable uh, hip, but they may cause uh, quite a stiffness. So there is another paper uh, of EPOS, and that shows us what's happening in Europe. So for 90% of our orthopedic surgeons in Europe did not, do not recommend a reduction of the sleep. 70% recommend a single screw for severe unstable hips. 11% uh, only recommend an open reduction and secondary osteotomies, 40% uh, for mild and 60% for severe sleeps. And the other interesting topic is contralateral hip. 32% of uh, European surgeons recommend a prophylactic uh, pinning. There are many papers with outcomes on uh, SCIFI. However, a very good paper from Mayo Clinic shows that 12% uh, of the operated SCIFI needed a reconstructive surgery, and the, the remainder of those 88%, 33% of them have still knee pain. Surgical dislocation and with the down procedure is a new procedure. It has the advance of an anatomical deduction of the femoral head, quite demanding procedure, and uh, needs quite a lot of experience. It's a bit early to say about the results, but the rates of AVN are still low compared to the other methods so far. Complications in SCIFI, many, like AVN, with a terrible result, like this. Fracture, when you remove the screw, a subtrochanteric or intratrochanteric fracture, chondrolysis, either malpositioning of the screw or many penetrations of the head. What about contralateral pinnings? Do we need to do it? We have to think that we are operating a healthy hip. We, nev we don't know whether the, this hip is going to have a skiffy or not. But we must, in my opinion, we must do it if the skiffy is in a very young age or there is an endocrine resort, uh, disorder that probably predisposes to that. There are new treatments that we are going to hear very soon about those, like hip arthroplasty. Uh, hip, sorry, <laughs> hip arthroscopy that can uh, reduce the calm effect and the FII. But what are we going to do? What's happening now about the very, dis the severely displaced skiffies, like this boy we had in our hospital, which was pinned in situ, but you can see very interesting that in two years there is quite good remodeling. He's very happy nearly no limitation of movements, nothing clinical. Or this autistic boy, chronic, you can see the effect on walking on the neck of the femur. We had to put two screws because of the uh, severity of the displacement, 
Uh, later on, we removed one because caused stiffness. At this moment, we are in this condition, mild and FAI and deformity, but we are talking about an autistic boy, very difficult to treat and follow the physical therapy afterwards. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. So, slip capital femoral epiphysis. This still remains a considerable source of controversy and also a research priority for us paediatric orthopaedic surgeons. I'm going to talk to you about some of the strategies for management of the symptomatic skiffy uh, post-initial treatment in what is a very difficult condition. So, the title of the talk was uh, Cause of FAI. I'll tell you that skiffy is the cause of femoracetabular impingement. And I'll also tell you that gold standard treatment for an, a slip presenting as a first thing is pinning in situ. And in my opinion, Skiffy does not remodel. And we don't know the best way to treat post-Skiffy deformity yet. So these are some statements which I, I agree some of you might find controversial. So if we use this as a case example, this is a 14-year-old boy who is about three or four months after having his hip pinned for a slip. So what's the prognosis for this hip and what symptoms is this boy going to have? His slip's been treated. So I'll tell you that he's got pain and he's got pain because he's got anterolateral impingement. He can't ride a bike because he's got obligate external rotation of that hip. His gait is all awkward. He limps. And some patients with hips like that are going to go on to develop osteoarthritis. And remember that these skiffy patients, they're predisposed to have problems, not just because of the slip, because their anatomy that predisposes it to occurring in the first place is not normal. They have acetabular retroversion, a lot of them, and some of them will also have femoral retroversion. And although long-term outcome studies, particularly some that come where you've got 40-year, 50-year follow-up, will tell you that most of these patients do well, these are historical cohorts where getting to work and sitting on a tractor will be considered a good outcome. But if you look at them a bit more carefully, about a third of them will have pain and stiffness after they've had a pinning, and this is the whole group together, including mild slips, and 10% of them will fail at 10 years, needing arthroplasty, which for a young patient is quite a thing to go through. And that's if you look at them all together. If you look at the severe slips or the acute slips, they do a lot worse. So here's an example. This is a treatment that one of my colleagues has been doing for many years at the Children's, uh, using de-threaded screws to allow ongoing femoral neck growth. And we know people in the past have used uh, smooth pins or the Hanson hook pin, which is a great pain to result in, uh, great pain to remove, as any hip surgeon that's tried to do a hip replacement with one still in will tell you. But a lot of people are going back and reinventing what I call the square wheel, i.e. A, a wheel that doesn't work, by saying that if you use de-threaded screws, the skiffy can remodel. Now, we know that the femoral neck will grow after pinning, whether you use a de-threaded screw or a, or a normal screw, but does it allow the deformity, the cam, to resolve? So that same patient you've just seen, this is them 18 months after the slip has pinned, Look how the screws, the de-threaded aspect, is now at the level of the physis. So these screws are changed, and the patient continues to grow two years after, and then at 36 months. But even then, although the femoral neck has grown, the cam still persists. So here's an example of someone uh, undergoing a surgical dislocation who's had their hip pinned. You can see there the screw, and the more severe the screw, the slip is, the bigger the cam will be, and the more anterior the screw will be. Look what happens as you flex the hip. That screw is abutting the labrum. When you look inside the acetabulum, you can see there's already extensive damage to the labrum. What's really interesting is if you treat acute slip capital femoral epiphysis with a surgical dislocation, even if the patient's only had symptoms for a few weeks, you will already see damage to the superior chondral surfaces as well as the labrum. So... Uh, this comes from the work of someone called Rab from the US, who is a real orthopaedic thinker and very underrated and uh, underread. So when uh, Rab was describing uh, Skiffy, and this has been popularized by Michael Leunig, formerly from uh, Bern, he described mild slips as causing what we call an inclusion bump, where the degree of the slip still allows inflection, the hip to rotate into the acetabulum. Mm -hmm. 
but it jams and damages the chondrolabial junction. So this is with a mild slip. Then you have more severe skiffy where the degree of deformity is much greater where it won't allow the whole of the femur, uh, the, the proximal femur to rotate in, into the acetabulum and you get almost an impaction type. And then you have the remodeling type, which is where the patient has the deformity, which to a degree has responded to the abnormal forces of the, of the hip. And so you get smoothing off of the area as bone is resorbed to allow that movement to take place. But this is not true remodeling, and the damage has already occurred. So there are lots of ways in which you can treat residual deformity, and you can divide them up into what part of the femur you will treat. So the neck osteotomies, if you remember, that's where the corer of the deformity is. It's closer to the actual aspect. It gives you great correction, but you risk damage to the blood supply. Then the trans trochanteric osteotomies, which are uh, obviously extra articular, and sub trochanteric osteotomies. And then you've got the role of arthroscopic treatment, which is a new thing to throw in. So on your left of that picture is Teddy Slongo, who's a pediatric orthopedic surgeon who works at Bern. And I went to Bern and I spent three months in that hospital to learn how to do the surgical dislocation approach. This is a patient who is six weeks post-surgical dislocation for a severe slip, and it's the right hip. And you can see there that he's got more internal rotation on the treated side than he has on the other side. And one thing else I noticed when I was there was the amount of visitors coming from other hospitals who are already using this technique, coming back, seeing them done in burn, and then realizing they weren't doing the procedure prop properly. But we're going to talk about this first because this, you can perform it as Fish does through an anterior approach. But remember, with a skiffy, you always have posterior medial callus, which forms really quickly. Even at three weeks, you'll see a big lump of posterior medial callus. So as soon as you take your wedge out of the neck and reorientate your head, that bump at the back of the neck is going to push on the, uh, on the blood supply to the femoral head. So... The advantage of a modified done is it gives you much safer control of the blood supply of the femoral head. Uh, it also allows you to see everything clearly and restore your deformity anatomically. But remember that the rate of AVN after a chronic slip is practically zero. So if you treat a chronic slip as opposed to an acute slip with this technique and the patient gets AVN, you have caused it. So here's some interoperative pictures where you can see the slip on the left and you can see the femoral head's been taken off with a little drill hole showing you that the head is still perfused. Um, and this is quite a scary thing to do. It's technically demanding and all you need is one assistant to twist the leg in the wrong direction and your blood supply to the head is gone. So you must bear that in mind. But it does give you a fantastic correction of the femoral head. And obviously maintaining the blood supply uh, through the, uh, the periosteal sleeve which remains attached to the femoral head is critical for the procedure. So here's an example of a, a case where it's been pinned and fixed and you can see, if you look carefully, just for a bit later, there is a little bit of heterotopic ossification around the greater trochanter where that's been uh, pulled down. So the complications of surgical hip dislocation, AVN, AVN, AVN. Bear that in mind, a catastrophic complication that we'll talk about a bit later on in some of the other talks. Rates of AVN, 2 to 24%. 2% in burn. Now, the originator series always gets great results. And as I said before, it's when everyone else can do the same thing and get the same results, you've got a good operation. Um, the other complications, chondrolysis, nerve injury, non-union, dislocation. Dislocation, a big problem, particularly in some centres where the patients are heavy, partly because the capsule's not closed properly after the surgery. But although that is the case, it still remains the best method of correcting the deformity. But remember, we're now getting 10-year outcome data from Burn itself. And they show that these patients, although you've restored the anatomy, they still later on sometimes require surgery because they're again getting impingement-type symptoms. So proximal femoral osteotomies are a lot more uh, favorable because you don't have that same risk of osteonecrosis because it's extracapsular, but again, because you're correcting the deformity away from where the deformity is, you create a secondary deformity, as you can see here in someone that's had this procedure performed. So here's an example of someone that's got a slip, they've got the bump at the front of the femoral neck, and if you do the osteotomy there, you create a second bump, although now, what many surgeons do is they combine this with an osteo osteoplasty at the same area, which then restores the offset at the front. So here, uh, this patient, let's say they had pain about a year ago, they've got limited range of movement. 
uh, look at the degree of translation they've got of the femoral head with a great big bump there. So you can correct this and you can correct rotation as well combined with an osteoplasty to restore some of the normal anatomy. But again, this is an extra articular procedure unless you do the osteoplasty. Um, that improves pain levels, it increases motion and increases function. But the next question is, does this actually improve your long-term outcome? So if we look at the, this data here, the outcomes of proximal femoral osteotomies, one thing I do want you to take away from this is, though, though it is a good procedure, if you look at all the series where this has been done, chondrolysis is a risk that is, is reported, but it's a very, very serious complication. The likelihood is, I, I think, that it happens because you're overloading, you're putting a lot of pressure on the femoral head. The other thing about the proximal femoral osteotomy is they only allow a certain degree of correction because the more correction you do, the less bony apposition you have where you've done your osteotomy. And it's still difficult to say whether combining it with osteoplasty gives better functions. The other thing is if you do an intertrochanteric osteotomy to correct your skiffy, you are again making it very difficult for the adult hip surgeons to come back and put a hip replacement in at a later date. And a lot of these patients will require it. Hip arthroscopy I won't talk about too much because I don't do this form of surgery, but I'm told by my colleagues that it's more technically demanding than it is for other conditions. Um, there is a trend for surgeons to move towards pinning and performing an arthroscopic procedure at the same time. Uh, but remember that when you're doing this, you're not actually putting the thick cartilage of the femoral head under the thick cartilage of the acetabulum. What you're doing is basically taking away the cam. So that might predispose to problems later on, but it can address some of the other pathology that you see. These pictures are from Michael Leunig's paper where uh, this was pretty much first described in any detail many years ago now. The outcomes of hip arthroscopy and skiffy, we again only have midterm results. Certainly what it tells us is it seems to be better if you do this earlier rather than later. So maybe the surgeons that are doing this acutely with their pinning are right maybe because the damage occurs very quickly once the slip has happened. So in summary, the treatment options for symptomatic FAI after skiffy are osteoplasty, which can be done open or arthroscopic, or one might give you a better view but have more complications than the other, treatment with surgical hip dislocation, or dealing it with a proximal femoral osteotomy. All of these have shown pretty reasonable outcomes. The complication profiles do differ. But again, we're looking at mainly level four evidence, which are case series, and it's very difficult to judge treatment unless you have a, a, a very good matched co uh, comparative group. Thank you. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I know it's late, so I'm, I won't be long. Uh, it's a privilege for me to be, uh, uh, to join this faculty of this wonderful meeting. So Thanos and uh, Babis, thank you very much indeed for this uh, kind invitation. So in my practice, the routine scenario is that um, the borderline cases are either missed or misdiagnosed. This has to do with young physicians, both orthopedic surgeons and radiologists. For those who have been attending a couple of courses or have been gone through some articles, they are very enthusiastic. And now I have from young consultants and specialists referrals from nine out of 10 hips that the indication in this painful hip in a young adult is femoral acetabular impingement. So we have overdiagnosis. <laughs> Uh, my purpose in the next uh, 18 and less minutes is to discuss the various phases of uh, femoral acetabular impingement and developmental dysplasia, but with, uh, with emphasis on the borderline cases, those who run subclinically, and to highlight the role of CT arthrography and MR arthrography. So the impingement syndrome, the FAI, is a painful syndrome which actually is the result of abnormal contact of anatomic structures, but at motion, as we see here. The intra-articular part of the FAA, of the impeachment syndrome, is the FAA, which is further classified as CAM and pincer. So in the CAM-type femoral acetabular impingement, we have a normal acetabulum. We have an abnormal femoral head, as you see here, a reduced femoral head, uh, and neck uh, offset, which is squeezed. This bony bump is squeezed under the acetabular rim, and then we have a labral tear, then the lamination of the articular cartilage, and in the end, osteoarthritis. It's too late for any kind of intervention here. Another example, 40 years old pain, 
the so-called tilt deformity or pistol grip deformity or cam deformity. We see the deformity, we have the impingement over there, osteoarthritis, again with some buttressing as we see here, cortical thickening on the medial aspect of the femoral neck, and again, it's too late for any kind of intervention. There are many papers regarding the quantitative or semi-quantitative estimation of the bony bump. For instance, this paper published a few years ago in osteoarthritis and cartilage suggests that the alpha angle has to be more than 60% in order to nominate the presence of the cam deformity, but almost 80 degrees to assess the symptomatology of this cam deformity. If you ask me, do I really evaluate the alpha angle in the clinical practice, I will say you no, not routinely. Here is an example, 41, right painful hip. Definitely we have pistol grip deformity on both sides. Osteoarthritis on the right side, but if we measure the alpha angle, on the left it's 100 degrees, on the right it's less. So it's interesting also, what's the lifestyle, what's the sports activity or the occupational activity of the patient? Here's another example. Definitely osteoarthritis, pistol grip deformity, rapid reprogressing. Can you imagine the age of this patient? 28, elite athlete in martial arts, again too late. So this is the perfect patient for both radiologists and orthopedic surgeons. We have an intact joint space. It's not narrowed. It's more than three millimeters. And MR arthrography can show very nicely the labral tear, but also that the articular surface is intact. Another athlete, weekend warrior, joint space intact labral tear on MR arthrography, articular cartilage is okay. Again, there are many papers in the literature regarding the alpha ankle as measured on MR. That means on oblique axial images, either on MR arthrography or on MR. It has been suggested that this angle has to be less than 55 degrees. Again, if you ask me, do I routinely measure this? The answer is no. Radiologists have to think as clinicians, for this lady, a borderline alpha angle may cause symptoms, whereas for this athlete drinking beer on a sofa, the, uh, a, an alpha angle of uh, 85 degrees can be totally asymptomatic. So we have to think as clinicians. And this is a quiz case for you. I suppose that you all agree that we have a pistol grip deformity here joint space narrowing, osteoarthritic changes, but if you notice carefully, there is also joint space narrowing on the medial aspect. MRI shows the bony bump here very nicely, also shows osteophytosis and joint space narrowing on the posterior inferior aspect, super anteriorly with labral degeneration, joint space narrowing also, bone marrow edema, so we definitely have a bony bump and osteoarthritis. But to stay out of trouble, you have to think also sometimes as rheumatologists, if you see this fatty replacement there, this suggests a previous inflammation. And as you can see here, there is early ankylosis, early bridging of the bone marrow, with some bone marrow edema remaining, suggesting chronic and active ankylosing spondylitis. Another case, 37, long-standing ankylosing spondylitis, where you can see the bump very nicely, the osteoarthritis, but the SI joints are gone. We have uh, definitely osteoarthritis because of hip involvement in the context of ankylosing uh, spondylarthritis, and hip involvement in ankylosing spondylarthritis has a worse prognosis in general. Stay also out of trouble by assessing promptly the advanced AVN. Here we see that we have development of a bony bump, but as you see on MR arthrography, this bony bump actually is the result 
of subchondral fracture. We see also the contrast into the subchondral fracture. Cortical, cortical disruption here and the bony bum resulting from the articular collapse. Moving now to the pincher type, a lot uh, of information on the literature is, uh, is related to uh, acetabular and retroversion. However, lateral overcoverage of any kind can also contribute to a pincher type femoral acetabular impingement like newborn formation, coxa profunda, and protrusor acetabuli. So, in the pincher type, the, vench, the version is wrong of the acetabulum. Here, uh, I described to the young uh, physicians in the, in the room how we can assess the acetabulum version normally. This is the posterior wall, the anterior wall. This has to be a part at the midpoint of the circle of at least one centimeter. What about this lady? She is a ballet dancer, 23, has a right painful hip for two years now at the limited range of motion. You can see now that the acetabular walls are not crossed upwards, but in the midpoint. So this is the crossover or the eighth sign which suggests acetabular retroversion. And here's a large subarticular cyst, which on MR arthrography shows communication with the joint. We see contrast in that and also a labral tear which is responsible for the symptomatology of the ballet dancer. Axial images are very reproducible in cross-sectional imaging like CT or MR for assessing the version. Normally, the anterior acetabular wall lies medially to the posterior one. In the retroversion, it lies laterally, and this is very reproducible. Other causes for over coverage are the protrusio acetabulum. Here we see a patient with long standing rheumatoid arthritis. We see the overlapping of the roof of the acetabulum over the ileoischial line. It has to be at least 3 millimeters in men, 6 millimeters in women. And again, stay out of trouble for lateral over coverage by assessing the SI joints. Here we see an ankylosis here in this young patient and the lateral over coverage actually is new bone formation at the enthesis, not only the acetabular rim but also in the lesser greater trochanda and this is a reactive arthritis previously known as Ryder syndrome. In my view, not that much in the literature, but according to my experience, the pincer type and cam type coexist in a large uh, percentage of patients. Here we see 39 male, you see the cam deformity and the crossover sign. Both symptoms at the same time, and MR arthrography is very useful here. We can see the posterior inferior labrum degeneration and tear. This is in keeping with uh, pincher type impingement, whereas the anterior superior and labral tear is with um, cam type impingement. Another patient, lateral overcoverage, definitely, but the side joints are gone again. And we can see that the new bone formation, both on the femoral neck hand uh, joint, but also in the acetabular rim, are the result of the extensive ossified and thesophytes. Last but not least, I would like to mention this case here so that you are aware of, of this condition. We can see a lateral over coverage of new bone formation. It's black, that means sclerotic bone. And this uh, young guy with a labral tear because of over coverage. And here is the CT. This is a Sappho syndrome, usually seen in young ladies. And AIDS stands for hyperostosis, which means lateral over coverage, as we see here. Huge anthesophytes and labral tear and osteoarthritis. And now a couple of minutes only for developmental <coughs> dysplasia. The topic has been addressed very nicely so far. So I would like just to show that uh, it, is, uh, it is a disorder which is more common than we think. It's missed or underdiagnosed by a radiologist. And as you can see here, a large percentage of patients, particularly those who are younger than 50 years old, have an uh, underlying developmental dysplasia for osteoarthritis and finally for total hip replacement. <laughs>
So the target group for radiologists and also for the, your community is the young adult who has mild hip dysplasia, very subtle radiological findings, and the, the aim is to prevent and delay osteoarthritis. So as we see here normally, the weight-bearing surfaces are parallel and the forces are applied over the entire area, the articular surface area. In mild developmental dysplasia, as we see here, with mild subluxation and lateral migration of the femoral head, the surface where the weight-bearing forces are applied is, is smaller. As a result, the human body in the beginning uh, enlarges the labrum in an attempt to keep the femoral head into the joint, and then the forces result into a tear, and in the end, into paralabral cyst formation. So whenever we see paralabral cysts, we are looking for a tear and for an underlying uh, uh, developmental dysplasia. We have listened to the Weiber's uncle, the 20 to 25 degrees is the is the target group because this subclinical dysplasia in an athletic person might result into symptomatology. Apart from the lateral over coverage, there is also the anterior, uh, uh, sorry, under coverage, it's also the anterior under coverage, which can be assessed with a VCA angle or the Kessens angle. Again, with the same figures, we don't have to to, to, to remember another figure is 20 to 25 degrees, but it's more reproducible to have images from cross-sectional imaging like CT or MR. So anterior acetabular sector angle, as you see, normally should be more than 60. In subclinical uh, developmental displays, is less than 50. This is more reproducible than the Lekesnes angle. Here is an example, we see large paralabral cyst formation. We have to look carefully for a tear. Here is the tear. But there are cases that we need to explore the, 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 the painful hip with arthrography. For instance, this is a surgeon in our city who had problems with hips forever, as he remembered from the adolescent period. But he was very athletic, he was trekking regularly. And a new pain appeared. You see borderline C angles, and MR arthrography shows very large labra, huge with tears. Another uh, lady, very young, you, we can see the deformity. Also, a fovea alta here. We can see that the labrum is huge, and there is a tear of the labrum. Another dysplastic hip bilaterally here with osteoarthritis. This patient was not able to undergo MR arthrography because of pacemaker, so we proceeded to CT arthrography. You see huge labrum with some partial tearing here and erosion of the articular cartilage. So regarding the question, which is better, CT arthrography or MR arthrography, we did a study uh, regarding uh, both techniques in the same patients with dysplasia. We found out that regarding the thickness of the articular cartilage, they are both doing very well, but regarding the labrum, MRI is much better, statistically speaking. Also here you can see a large geode with gadolinium inside which suggests communication with the joint, whereas um, the contrast media here, the iodine is not seen because MR has increased contrast to noise ratio uh, uh, with regard to CT. So the key points here is not only the C angle or the acetabular uh, sector angle, but also the labral swelling. It's the only disorder which enlarges the labrum. It's important. And whenever we see paralabral cysts, we are looking carefully for a tear in order to prevent uh, an osteoarthritic process. So our role uh, in treating patients is to depict early and promptly the internal derangement in both disorders that we discussed today and provide you with the best information regarding the internal aspect of the joint that might be useful to you and also for the benefit of the patients. Thank you very much for your attention.